Hi, welcome to the Bridge Podcasts. We hope you enjoy the following message. For more information on all that's happening at the Bridge Church, please visit www.bridge-church.com. Some of you might be able to tell what that is, actually, because it's kind of peeking out the top. But let's just call it a cola drink. (laughs) Ginger. (laughs) Amen. You know, um, if you do know what this is, and I didn't know if I even needed to do this, you know, like, uh, you know, no no, uh, brand promotion, just gratuitous brand promotion, because there's more than one cola drink. In the, in, in the world, certainly in Scotland. And, uh, but there's many things that claim to be the real thing. Isn't that right? Um, if you grew up in the... Well, if you grew up... Coca, oh, oh, my. Um, cola, cola has been around for a long time. An awful long time. And so you'll have heard all of the advertising and marketing jargon over the, the decades... You know, I'd like to teach the world to sing, and uh, um, it's the real thing, and all this kind of stuff. So anyway, we know that one of these one of these products is this iconic product in a red and white can, and the other ones in a blue, white, and red can. And then there's your Scottish ones as well. You know, your independent cola manufacturers, and um, this old thing. I didn't know this, but this over 130 years old, this cola brand. Did you know that? And um, in the 1970s, um, the the brand manager for this cola drink here, he wanted to reach the the young generation and really sell a lot of cola. And um, so they came up with this advertising campaign, and he said this. He said that Research shows that young people seek the real, the original, and the unnatural as the escape from phoniness. So there must have been some phony colas out there at the time, I don't know. But it was all promoted and advertised as this big lifestyle thing, you know, this cola thing. And so, you know, nothing's really changed. Every generation, every subsequent generation wants something new don't they? They want something new. They want something exciting. And so um, all of these uh, cola companies went to to war with each other. I guess the cola wars, you could call it. And um, every cola claimed to be the premium cola. It's like, no, this is the real thing. No, this this is the max, or this is the best, or whatever the case may be. And uh, of course, we here in, in Scotland, there's only one drink. Yes, yeah, it. There's, on, there's only one, and it actually does contain iron. I just I found out that it contains ferrous metal, so it is actually iron brew. Um, and so, but just like iron brew, the the secret ingredient is supposedly guarded in a vault somewhere, and it's a family secret, and no one no one knows. It's passed down from one. Uh, owner or one family to the next and, you know, the bars company or whatever. And so there's all of this going on. And um, you get, you look at the ingredients and it's like carbonated water. Okay, I've all got that. But then you get to the one and it just says flavoring. And it doesn't, there's no other details. It just says that, that's it. So the secret sauce must be in there somewhere. But I actually found the recipe for one of the cola drinks, the, one of the famous cola drinks this week. I was interested to, to read it. So I don't know how, how close a, closely guarded a secret it actually is. But, you know, these products here, we all know them well. They generate, the, 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 the revenue from, from them is enormous. The advertising for, for them is would make your eyes water. And there is actually... Nothing better, although I've kind of gone off kind of sugary carbonated drinks, but there's nothing better than an ice cold cola on a hot day. I remember when I was an apprentice, we used to, in the South African sun, we'd get outside as soon as we can at lunch, we'd buy the glass half liter bottle, the glass half liter, and we'd find a machine that had a skip somewhere, and we'd go and sit in the back of the skip and bake and drink our cola, our ice cold cola. And that would cool you down and pep you up. 
Um, but this whole thing is, you know, is nothing new. It's right across every product known to man, food, clothing, cosmetics, you name it. Everyone claims that once you try our product, you'll never go back. This is the best. You'll stick with us for the rest of your life. And so this morning, um, I also was so glad because I had no idea what the worship songs were this morning. And they all talk about the goodness of God. And um, especially uh, uh, Good, Good Father, um, you know, uh, what's the words of the first verse? Um, uh, the, I've, I've heard a thousand stories. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. I thought, wow, this just really flows into this message this morning. I've heard all these stories of, of, what, they, of what they think you like, but has it, have they actually tasted your goodness? They actually experienced your goodness? And a lot of us, you know, we'll never actually get across the Rubicon to the taste thing because other senses get in the way first sometimes. Our other senses, our, our daughter's just been in Taipei and she didn't eat anything. No, not, critis, not throwing shade on Taipei, but she would, wouldn't eat a thing because it just, everything, she couldn't cross that barrier of, I'm going to eat that because it, nothing was, nothing appealed. And so with all of these things, every effort under the sun is made. Just try it and just do it one time. And in fact, if you take that across life, it applies to so many things that we try. Just try it just one time. Try it. And uh, I thought about that, and I, th I thought to myself, yeah, I can promise you one thing. I've tried many things just once, and I wished I'd never tried them. I wished I'd just passed up the opportunity. But anyway, Psalm 34, verse 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Try a wee bit. Just a small quantity. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Imagine a person in the company of his friend, friend or friends. And this person has previously enjoyed or something for the first time. All right. It's so good. It's like I've just discovered. It's this like a new discovery. It's so good. And he's sticking with it. It's, it was so beneficial to him so satisfying that he cannot not encourage his friends to try it. Do you, have you ever been in that situation? You've really got to try this. You've got to do this. Just a wee bit. And in that psalm, in Psalm 34, the psalmist is David. And he's the one that says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And so what he's really saying in that whole psalm is saying, I was looking for the Lord, and you know what? He answered me. He actually answered me. I was looking for him. He heard me. He answered me, and he took my fears away. Is there anyone with, with the, who struggles with fear and anxiety in this room today? David says, I was looking for the Lord, and he heard me, and he took my fears away. David says, I even look different now. Not only did he do that, but he took my shame away. And I even look different. And he says then, he goes on, and I'm kind of paraphrasing this psalm. He says, it doesn't matter what your status is, if you're rich or if you're poor. God responds to those who seek him, and he delivers you out of all of your troubles. It doesn't matter how much, your money won't buy you out of trouble. That's, we know that doesn't work. It can maybe work for a time. So it doesn't matter what your status is. He goes on to say, if you reverence, and I want to I share with you this morning, some people say, oh, I read about the fear of the Lord all the time in his word. And that word means honoring the Lord and reverencing. Take him seriously. Take him seriously. If you reverence the Lord, he'll make sure that you don't go short and you won't lack any good thing. That's amazing. You're not going to run short. Some of us have more month than money. 
My dad says that a lot. More month than money. But he says, if you will reverence me, you will not go short. You will not lack. And then David says, I've found the protection of the Lord and his angels actually camp around me. Angels. Angels camp around me. And then David says, I'm saying all of this, but I can actually give you evidence. I can give you evidence of God's goodness. I want you to know that God, his stare is upon you. His eyes are always looking at you and his ears are always listening for your cry, for your shout. And do you know what else? He wants to bless you with a long life and not a long bad life and a long difficult life, but with a long life with good days, filled with good days. And do you know what else? How much more is in Psalm 34? Do you know what else? When you're feeling down and depressed, when your spirit feels crushed, God comes especially close to you and he wants to rescue you from despair. He wants to reach out and, and get you, grab you and rescue you from despair, the pit of despair. And then David goes on to say, and that here's a bit of reality check. You will probably experience trouble, but God will deliver you without any broken bones. You're going to have trouble times, but God's going to deliver you and not one of your bones are going to be broken. And when an enemy comes against you, God is going to condemn them and you won't be condemned. You won't experience any condemnation. So Psalm 34, the overwhelming message here seems to be if you would just try this, if you would try putting your trust in God, or you might say, just test it. Do the taste test. Experience this for yourself. I can talk all day about what God's done in my life. I could get Ellie and Lewis and Linda up here and they could say, God has started doing this in my life from that age. And we could talk all day long and hopefully it would move you closer to wanting to taste and see, but you have to experience it for yourself. Amen. There's no other way of really knowing how good God is. And someone said this to me one time, and this was a wake-up call, and I still think about it. You won't get to heaven on the faith of your father. Have your own faith. You can't hang on to your mammy's apron strings forever. You have to let go and do it yourself. You're not going to get there on the faith of your friends or the faith of your dad or your mom. No matter, they can be a general in the faith that will make no difference unless you have saving faith in yourself. Saving faith. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 3 says, Get rid of all evil behavior and be done with all that deceit and hypocrisy and jealousy and all unkind speech. Like a newborn baby, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a fullness, a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of God's kindness. You know, sometimes a taste is enough to whet your appetite for more. And this is our job as the church is brothers and sisters in Christ, to let that, the goodness of God shine through our lives and wet other people's appetite. Yeah, this is, this, come and taste this. And it's my, if my experience is true, you'll witness with that this morning. What's brought joy to me will bring joy to you. Amen. You'll come to appreciate God's goodness just as I have. That's what David's saying Come and know him the way that I've known him. And he had some reasons to be concerned because he had done some heinous things. Adultery and setting up a murder and all sorts of stuff. And um, my, my. And he's saying, I've, I know the Lord's goodness. Amen. If you're in danger, look to the Lord. 
If you're stuck in sin, believe in him. If you're afflicted, then seek him. If you feel wretched, cast your cares upon him. And if you've tried and you've tried and you've tried and you've tried to find happiness in this world, happiness can be found in him. And some of us go from young age trying to find that just what is the just that thing, uh, utopia or whatever they call it, that the place where everything is perfect and I'm happy. And it doesn't last for long. There's all true happiness is in him. And I was, last night I was praying in my room and I was praying for peace in my house, in my house and in the house of the Lord. And I was praying and I was praying, Father God, whenever my son or my daughter come home, let them know your peace. Let them walk into stillness in my house. Lord God, how do I, how do I, how do I, how do I enjoy that stillness and peace? And then I began to look into myself. Father God, forgive me if I've had any lustful thoughts in my own home. Forgive me if I've, forgive me if there's pride in my life. All of these things. Father God, I don't want to offend your presence I want your presence in my house. I want your presence in my car. I want your presence in our church. I don't want to offend your presence. And I realize that I've got things that come up in my heart, in my life, that can push it away, push it back. And I want people, I want visitors to come to my home and walk into stillness and peace. I want visitors to walk in here into stillness and peace. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm certain that you'll find what you're looking for and you'll renounce everything else and put your trust alone in God if you can taste his goodness. Because he's the author of everything that's good. He's not the author of evil. He's the author of good. Amen. The, and we know he's a trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all good. The Father is good. We sang it this morning, good Father. He's got a good design for your life. He's got a good design. He's provided good things for, for you. He's made good promises in his word, and they're for us. And he gives good gifts to us. Sometimes not always the gifts that we want, but the gifts that we need at the time. And the Son is good. Jesus is the good shepherd who laid down his life for us. And he is a good shepherd. He is the, the great shepherd. And so we, you know, anyone who is leading a life group or a small group or mentoring people or pastoring people, we've got to look to the great shepherd. Oh, the way that you cared for souls. How do we care for souls? That's what we need. Amen. And so he's good. He's a fountain of grace to the church. He's a fountain of grace to you. He's a fountain. He's sitting on the right hand of the Father speaking a good word on your behalf today. He's saying, I'm speaking a good thing for Nadia today. I'm Nadia's advocate. I'm speaking a good word for her today. And then the Spirit is good. The Holy Spirit is good. He's working in your heart. You're sitting here this morning. The Holy Spirit has already begun to speak to you. He's showing you things. He's showing you things. And he's giving you the ability to discern God's goodness. And to look back and say, when I was 22 years old and I had a car accident, or a motorcycle accident, and I'll keep on ticking them off. Remember, I saved you. I was there. I was there. The Holy Spirit's working in you, casting your mind, causing your mind to go back to where you were and saying, I rescued you. I redeemed you. I saved you from that. I was even saved from a relationship once. <laughs> <laughs> some things you just go into and like, no, I'm going to do this. Um, we don't think that's a good idea, son. Well, <clears throat> and then off you go. And God says, well, give, give it time. Give it time. 
he'll, he'll, he'll see the error of his ways. But when we surrender our lives, our will to, the God, we, uh, to God, we get to enjoy a new taste. And it's only a small taste of something greater to come. Because what is coming? For those who are born again, heaven. Heaven is in your future. Amen. And the more you taste God's goodness, the more you will, know, you, the more you will desire to be in heaven. Amen. So taste and see that God is good. Be ready. Expect to taste his goodness. Expect to taste, if you've tasted nothing but sour stuff your whole life, expect to taste his goodness, which is good. You know, it's, the, the word tells us it's sweet like a honeycomb, like dripping honey. It, the, the, word, the, the metaphors in the word are so beautiful when it comes to describing God's love and goodness. It's like so sweet and, and, and good. Amen? So expect something new. Expect him to fill your old wineskin with new wine. Amen. Amen? Expect him to fill it with new wine. The old man can't contain the new man. This is the, and herein lies the struggle. Amen? Your soul has a shape. It has direction. It has purpose. It has a course. Your soul has desires. Amen? And God just doesn't take an old wineskin and patch it up because we know what happens when you put new wine in an old wineskin. It pulls the patch tears. It pulls away. He wants to pour new wine into a new skin. Amen? A new skin. The old passes away and our souls become renewed. And new life needs new food. Taste and see that I have the food that you need for your new life. Yeah? Isaiah chapter 43. Forget the former things and don't dwell on the past. Amen. Forget the former things. Forget the old things. Don't dwell on the past. Because I am doing a new thing. It's springing up now. Can't you see it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Wow. Do you know in, the, in context, Isaiah is speaking to God's people. And he's saying, you guys, I want to remind you. In spite of your continual unfaithfulness to God, he's been merciful to you. You guys have been a burden on God. God hasn't even burdened you. He hasn't said, I desire more offerings, more sacrifices, all of this. That chapter actually says, God, God says, tell them I have not been a burden on them, but they have been quite a burden on me. And we always think it's the other way around. Oh, God expects so much of me. I just don't know how I can manage it. I delivered you through a sea. All the chariots that came after you were swallowed up. I wasn't a burden on you, but you've wearied me. Your honor, so we're getting back to that word fear. Your honor for me is gone. Your reverence for me has become, has become nothing, and you've become thankless. Forget the former things. Isn't God so gracious? Forget the former things, though. Do not dwell in the past. I'm going to do a new thing. Amen? And so he's going to do a new thing. He's going to put new wine into new wineskins. Luke chapter 5 tells us about that. 36, verse 36. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and uses it to patch an old one. For then the new garment would be ruined and the new patch wouldn't even match the old garment. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins for the new wine would burst the wineskins spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine must be stored in new wine skins. But no, this is interesting because it's only Luke that adds this, this bit. But no one who drinks the old wine seems to want the new wine. <laughs> the old one's fine. The old, the old stuff is good. It's fine. They say, wow. Wow. Taste and see. Taste something new. 
Don't be satisfied with the old. Taste something new. When it talks about new and old, it's not just talking about age. You can be the oldest person in this room and be vital and new. Yes, vital and new. But it's talking about the nature of something. It's talking about the essence. It's talking about how good it is. And new wineskins are like new goat skin or whatever they put it in. It's strong, supple, flexible, able to accommodate this new wine. But what are old wineskins? What do they look like? They're thin and they're brittle. And if you bend them, they crack. Amen. It's impossible to put the new wine into the old wineskin because as soon as the new wine begins to ferment and the gases start to come off, the wineskin is just going to explode everywhere. And everything is lost. The new wine is lost. Everything is lost. It's a complete loss. And sometimes you say, well, why can't we just keep on? Everything's fine. Why can't the old exist with the new? Well, because God says it can't. Why can the new not inhabit the old? It's futile to try and do it alongside one another. Jesus is making it clear, the old man cannot contain the new man. Or the new man will be lost. Just like the old wineskin, the old man cannot expand. The old man cannot accommodate, cannot grow with the new things that God is putting into your life. I think that's amazing. Amen. Because there's a new nature being poured into us, it's nothing to do with age. It's to do with the essence of what God has put in your life. We can't stay the same. We're a new creation. Colossians chapter 3 verse 9 says, Don't lie to each other. Since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and in the image of its creator, don't lie to each other. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 22, you were taught with regard to your former way of life, your old ways, put them off. They, they have been corrupted by the desires of your soul, your, old, your soul the way it was to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on a new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Only a new nature can contain the new growth, the new fruits, the new character, everything that he's got for you. Amen? It's new. And he does love you. He loves you where you are. If you think, well, I'm just, I'm, I'm old and good for nothing. No, no, no. He loves you. Right where you are right now, he wants to take you and make you who he created you to be. He wants to make new wine out of you. So we need to stop trying to put, pour the new into the old. Amen? And this has been one of the things that, you know, anyone heard of weariness, even in the body of Christ? Tiredness, exhaustion, weariness, all of this. Here's where, what tries to happen, and it's just human nature to, ha to want more, but to sacrifice less. We want more. We want, we want the good. We want the new and everything, but we prefer not to give up so much to get it. Amen? We don't want to release the old. We crave the change. We would really, truly want to change, but we stay in this stagnation in the old ways. Amen? And in this culture here, it's all about the more the better. You know, indulge yourself. Whatever we put out there, have a go at that, taste in that. Some people think the more, the more I live life, the more I live life to excess, the better my life is going to be. Why get rid of the old stuff? But we can't have it both ways. In God's kingdom, it's his way. It's his way uh, you know what I'm going to say, aren't, aren't you? <laughs> it's his way. It's his way. Jesus came to follow, follow my ways. Follow my ways. Amen? So choose. Isn't it amazing that God always gives us choice? We always have choice. Choice is vital to our lives. So we need to put off the old 
nature and put on the new nature. Amen? We have to choose it, though. We have to choose it. Choose life. I set before you blessing and cursing, life and death. Choose the life part of it. Choose life. And when we taste and see that he's good and think, oh, yeah, I want, I want this new life, this, this new wine. Even if you're a Christian in this place, it's time for new wine. Yes. It's time for new wine. I want a renewed mind. I want my actions to change, and I want to live life to the full. And it's like, well, it's not go life is not going to look like what it was. It's going to be different, but it's going to be better. But it won't be as exciting. It'll be more than exciting. If you are obedient to the, the voice of the Lord, it will excite you. In fact, it will terrify you. <laughs> it will be exciting. And he wants to do, take your heart today, and he wants to make that the new wine skin, and he wants the best tasting wine to come out of you. Amen? All of these things will change your life. He'll put a new heart in you. He talks about that in Ezekiel. I'll put a new heart inside you. Amen? A new, a new heart. All he asks us to do is come to, the, come to the cross. Taste my goodness. I'm, I've evidenced it already by sending my son Jesus to die for you. And if you will receive him, as in Romans 10, 9, and confess him with your mouth that he is Lord, that he's the son of God, that he died on a cross for you, and on the third day he was, he was resurrected from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. Amen? But God is not going to force you. He won't force anyone in this room to do that today, to make that decision. He won't force anyone on the live stream to make that decision. It is our choice. It is our choice. Thanks for listening. Remember to visit our website, www.bridge-church.com and connect with us via Facebook and Twitter.